We will start momentarily in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and then we will spend a lot of time in the Revelation. Uh, because, well, let me just back up for a minute. If you wanted to behold Jesus, where in the Bible would you turn? Anywhere. Jesus tells us in Luke 24 that all the Old Testament spoke of him. And so in the Old Testament, we find him prophesied. We find him as the second person of the Godhead carrying out various and sundry actions, not by the name of Jesus. It was by him that all things were created. And then you get to the Gospels. You say, oh, it would have been so great to have been with those 12 apostles and walk with Jesus. I'll agree with that. But we're in a better position. If they were in Galilee and he was somewhere else, they were not where he was. Because of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the child of God is never where he is not. He is always with us. And we can turn to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and especially just walk with Jesus and experience him in the midst of dealing with so many, many situations. And then here in what was read a few moments ago, a wonderful passage that starts in the middle of a story. He's given chapter 11, which is an amazing presentation in, Luke, in, in Hebrews, of people who've gone before us, who've walked with God. And so he says, in, in light of, or because, we have this great cloud of witnesses that we therefore can and should lay aside every week. Wait, we have a lot of different people who've gone before us. And you're in a situation, well, I can't make it, I can't do it. I, well, there have been people who've gone before you who did. And God has recorded it, and he's given us the Holy Spirit to bring it home to our hearts. But even in that passage, and he goes on to say that uh, all of this empowers us to lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. Would, would you like to agree with the writer of Hebrews that, e that sin easily besets? Is, is there anyone here that say, no, I don't believe that? If you've lived very long at all, you know that's true. And God has so made us that we are kept dependent upon him. And God has not only made us to be dependent upon him, he has given us gracious provisions and this is certainly one of them. The great cloud of witnesses and then Jesus himself primarily. Looking unto Jesus. We can benefit from all those who have gone before us. But in the midst of all of this what we are doing is looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher. The beginner and the end and all in between of our faith. And he goes on to say we need to walk this way lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. Um, if you are observant at all, you know that in the last several years there has been an enormous fainting and fading away of people who once seemed to walk with God, who once seemed to have a heart to seek after God, and so we, we, we have a whole new series of fears and doubts and situations. And if there's ever a time that we needed to behold Jesus and look at him seriously and on a regular basis. And by the way, as we come to the Lord's table, that's what we're doing. We're beholding Jesus. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you're invited. This is not a Baptist table. This is the Lord's table. If you're a Christian here this morning, when we get to that point of the service, uh, you're welcome. So, beholding Jesus, lest we faint. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon our minds and hearts, that we would hear the word of the Lord. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we must fix our gaze upon Jesus. There's a lot of things in the world that want 
us to gaze upon them and then just take a Sunday morning glance at Jesus. We got it all wrong. You don't have to live as if uh, the problems in, in your world and the problems in our world at large are not there. They are there. All kinds of rumors and evidences that things may get worse and all of that. Glance at that. But put your gaze on Jesus. And that's what we want to do here this morning, to put our eyes on Jesus. And that will cause us to grow in our faith. Faith is strengthened. Faith is empowered as we gaze and look upon Jesus, we're empowered to make godly choices. Behold Jesus. Other translations, standing near him, walking with Jesus, beholding him. And so again in the Gospels, we behold him. And in the Revelation, we see him. And this is particularly uh, you say, well, you, you go to this book very often. Yes, I do. Because it is a unique book that has a special promise to those who read it, those who hear it, those who heed it. Blessed are those. And you say, well, there's a lot of stuff in there that scares me. Well, you know why? Because you're gazing on the wrong thing. The book of Revelation is, about, is not about all the stuff that one day will be or is in the headlines of the world. And it doesn't matter whether they get it right or whether they get it wrong. It's stuff. It's out there. It's, it's getting worse. And it goes in ups and downs and has been this way since the fall of man. And, and if you're wringing your hands and, and fearing about tomorrow and uh, I wish I had enough money to really uh, hide away and and, and build a cave and, and do all this stuff, uh, you're gazing at the wrong thing. We need to be like the missionary John Payton, who years ago, I guess things were pretty calm where he lived, but he wanted to go, felt God wanted him to go to the Hebrides among the headhunters in parts of Africa who were famous for, for shooting poison arrows and never missing. And, of course, he was cautioned not to go. But he went on this position. He said, I'm invincible till God calls me home. He was not gazing at the wrong thing. He was beholding Jesus, and Jesus was able to keep him or to take him home. But that's the beauty of being a Christian. Whether you live or whether you die, you are the Lord. You can't lose. So you don't have to live in morbid fear. You don't have to refuse to be a Christian because somebody might say something bad or you might lose your job. You might not get the promotion. You don't have to worry about all that because your life is in his hand. Behold him. It will strengthen your faith. Here's reality. When our eyes are not on Jesus, we focus on the storms of life. And just like Peter, we sink. The apostle Peter was not above getting his eyes off Jesus and on the circumstances. And when you do, like Peter, we sink. Do you ever focus on the storms of life? It can be health issues. It can be job issues. It can be anything. And you get trapped by giant fear or led astray by the lures of pleasure. I don't know how you would measure it, but Man has always had pleasure. Man has always had people who make it their business to offer pleasure and to entice you with pleasure. But you used to have to go hunt it at least a little bit. Now all you have to do is pull out your cell phone. People everywhere. And so you get your focus on your opinions and your focus on... on uh, Whatever. Or maybe you're here and your focus is on somebody wronged you. You're singing the 50th verse of somebody did me wrong song. We've all added some verses of that every now and then. There's so many things that keep us locked into the wrong focus. This is why 
we must focus on Jesus. I must behold him. I am here to please and to honor and serve Jesus. That must be my confession. To be loyal to him. And motivation, fresh motivation, to be loyal to Jesus Christ is supercharged as we behold him. We're coming to the Lord's table again today and from the preaching of the word and from coming to the Lord's table, the Holy Spirit will increase our faith to walk away from here looking unto Jesus in whatever situation we're facing. Now, in the Revelation, and we're, we're skirting through and we're hitting high points here, and I hope that you will go home and open your Bibles with the Holy Spirit being your teacher and spend some time there. It's so refreshing to go to the book of Revelation and you don't have a system of prophecy you're trying to figure out. You don't have a, a, a focus on when's this going to happen? What those? You have a singular focus. If there was ever a clue in broad daylight, here it is. What's the title of the last book of the Bible? The Revelation. The unveiling of Jesus Christ. And you unveil him there as he's working among his redeemed people. You, you see him there as he's working and controlling and moving and deciding and making choices about the nations of the world. Uh, you see him there as the curtains are open and all the folks in heaven, angelic beings and those redeemed are worshiping day and night. You, you open the book and you find over 20 something times Jesus as the Lamb. For all eternity, he'll be seen as the Lamb. You cannot read the book of Revelation without beholding Jesus. If you read the book of Revelation, you come away with something else, read it again. You missed it. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 1, there's this glorious portrait of Jesus Christ in the first several verses of chapter 1. I'm hesitant to use this because this print in, in this Bible has gotten smaller as years have gone by. But uh, in chapter 1 of the Revelation, John was given a, a scene one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet were likened to brass as, as if it burned in a furnace and his voice was as the sound of many waters. Now you say, well, that didn't do a lot for me. Well, you do need a little bit of research to get to, to understand that what we're seeing here is Jesus being revealed as the high priest with the appearance of all wisdom. He is holy, 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 and he is coming to judge. Uh, he is in charge. No one else is, and his voice cannot be negated. Uh, Jesus speaks through the word of God today in your private reading or from the preaching of the word, and we yawn and we go on our way. But when Jesus comes back, he'll have your attention. And it's a wonderful day today when we open the word of God and we're not grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit and we behold Jesus and he gets our attention. And we begin to be in awe and begin to be amazed and begin to wonder why on earth would God love me? I'm surprised that God would save anybody, especially me. And yet he's saving a numberless multitude out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and people. Wow. I thought the only thing that was happening on the face of the earth is all the stuff you read about in the papers and see on the news. 
The world wants you to gaze on all that. Right now, Jesus is doing exactly what he said he would do. I will build my church. And he is building his church. There are people being saved in kingdoms and peoples and tribes all over the world. That's why we support missionaries. That's why we especially like to support missionaries that are involved in church planting. Because of extending the gospel. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus sends personal letters to the churches. It's good to read these chapters and, and get a personal application to your life or to your family. But you ought to read it if you're, assembly, if you're a member of this church, for example. Uh, you ought to read it and say, now, Lord, what are you saying to us? What are the things you like? What are the things you commend? What are the things you don't like? What are the things you're telling us repent or else? What are the things that you're revealing about yourself? He gives a number of characteristics of himself in these Letters. All of this gives encouragement, gives discipline, gives reproof. In all of this, he is shepherding his sheep. How encouraging. Jesus is actively working all over the earth, building up those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In chapter 4, the very throne of the universe is unfailed, and the Creator God is on his throne with various angelic beings around, around, and they worship night and day. Now let's be honest. A lot of us have spiritual fainting fits. We ought to be strong in the Lord, but we fall down and we tremble and we stump our toe and we say things and do things we know we shouldn't do. And, and uh, you need to check your worship gauge. You know, you travel in your vehicle and you uh, you might not, I don't know what you do with an electric car, but most of us have gas vehicles and you use a little gauge. And when it goes down, you start thinking about needing some gas. Well, we as Christians, we're not, we're not, that's not the way you live the Christian life. Fill it once and forget it. 300 miles later, add more. The Christian life is not on the reservoir principle. The Christian life is on the contact principle. It's more like the old trolley cars, maybe out in San Francisco, and the thing moves when there is connection. If there's no electrical connection, there's no movement. And we are stymied in our Christian faith, and we have spiritual fainting fits when we neglect to behold the Lamb of God, when we neglect to have fellowship with him. The more we gaze upon him, the more we will worship him. And the more we worship him, the more we will have a godly focus. All heaven is totally focused on the Lamb, on the triune God. In chapter 5, Jesus, the eternal God, un is unveiled uh, as to his grand redemption accomplishments. In chapter 5, uh, verse 9, he says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to open the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by every, out of every kindred tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You have a glorious present and an amazing future, child of God. It's no small potatoes to be here today if your sins are forgiven. We come to the Lord's table. Boy, that should grip us afresh and anew. My sins are forgiven. And not only that, I'm a child of the king, and I'm not just a child of the king. I'm a king and priest in his kingdom. I have the power through the indwelling Holy Spirit to rule over circumstances, to win spiritual battles, and I have the power through the living out of the gospel and telling the gospel to bring people to Christ for him to save them. What a calling. You said, well, I don't know how I missed that. I thought my calling was to be a plumber or, or to be this or uh, to go make money or to pursue my hobbies and go to church on Sunday if there's nothing else in the way. 
when you start beholding Jesus, when who he is, when who he is grips you, you're, you'll not be satisfied with just mere weekend church anity. You'll be excited about biblical Christianity where Jesus Christ is not just Lord over the earth, but Lord of your life and your, your Savior, your shepherd, who's guiding you and leading you in green pastures. He's a glorious lamb. In chapter 5, we see an amazing sight that shows us a key insight on how to win spiritual battles. Now, the things that are revealed there, John knows that if those seals cannot be opened, everything is doomed. Satan wins. So he's weeping out of fear. And he said, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Oh, that's great. A lion. I've got circumstances in my life. Lord Jesus, give me a lion. Make me like a lion. Might need to guard me a little bit. I might want to attack somebody. And he looks. And he sees a lamb slain. The radical key to the Christian life is deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. We win by laying down our life. We win by walking in the steps of Jesus. We have the strength of the lion as we manifest the spirit of the lamb. And what glorious praise there is in heaven in the midst of all these scenes. Again, in uh, chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. There was a loud voice saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that heard them were heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. You cannot read the book of Revelation but to see that all of the angelic beings and all of the redeemed who are already in heaven are totally mesmerized by the Lamb, by the Son of God, and moved to praise. Not coming to a building and you got people with all kinds of instruments and making all kinds of sounds of, of music that we like and the, the music that we loved and when we were pagans and, and we still love the music and so we want music like that. We'll put some Christian words to it. And, and talking to a fellow recently, he said, I, I go to a church and I don't understand a thing that, that is sung. You can't hear a thing that is sung. The music is so loud. We have a lot of music in the Bible. You know what God preserved? The words. We don't know the tunes. He said there's some places that talk about instruments. But there's nothing in the Bible to where the instruments prevail to overshadow the words. What God says is what we need in our heart. And that's why we love to encourage people, don't steal a hymn book. Don't take one of these home. But we like to encourage people encourage people to get hymn books. Now we have some we'll give you. Many of you should already have hymn books in your home. You say, well, I can't sing. Say the praise then. A lot of the praise that is given in the book of Revelation is not sung, but it is said. Get off your lame excuses. Talking to me too. We will take an honest gaze upon Jesus is transforming. Are you here today and you can say by the grace of God I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And you're going to come to the Lord's table and rejoice in that. And you say but even so I get discouraged. I need some encouragement. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. 
You may wake up the next morning and your circumstances have not changed, but you'll be transformed. And sometimes it's like this. A few of you know, and might as well let the rest of you know. There was a Sunday morning here many years ago. And I was sitting in a classroom, and the teacher turned to 1 John. If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He turned to James, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. I was ready to go crawl in a hole. Because on Friday night, I was trying to be a nice guy. My wife was in nursing school in those days, and she'd come home at 9 o'clock or so, and I knew she'd be tired, so I'm cleaning up the kitchen. And I look on the vent over the stove, and it's dusty. She's not tall enough to see that. I am. So I swept across it, and there was an electrical shortage. It shocked the fire out of me. And I immediately cursed like a sailor, just like I used to do down on the farm in the wintertime when the cow would step on my ingrown toenail. And I put my number 12 in the stove. It was the closest thing handy to hit. Hit the thermostat, tore it all to pieces. Saturday morning, a godly man in the church sees me at Carlos. Brother Bell, what are you doing? Oh, no, everything's fine. I just need a thermostat. Well, everything wasn't fine. And everything wasn't fine, as I said in that class. And God in his mercy had cornered me. And somehow, by the grace of God, I found myself telling that class of what I had done. I had asked God's forgiveness, and I needed their forgiveness. And it was granted. And before the auditorium, the same thing. It was granted. You know what? On Monday morning, none of my circumstances had changed. I still had all the same pressures, all the difficulties we were going through. But now I was a free man because of the Lamb. Because... By the grace of God, my focus turned from my circumstances to gaze upon the Lamb. In chapter 6, we see the Lamb with executive and administrative authority sitting at mission, tro- mission control of the universe, doing what? He's opening seals and making decrees that affect the whole human race. And it goes through a litany, uh, a turning aside of apostasy and war and famine and death and martyrdom of saints. That's been the history of the world for a long time. And it ebbs and flows and ups and downs. And we seem to be in in an upswelling of all this. But you see, I don't see any encouragement there. Well, don't stop before you get to the end of the story. Which is unveiled a little bit later in chapter 7. The encouragement, first of all, is that Jesus is in charge, not man. He's orchestrating these events. He's ruling and overruling. With divine decree, these things. Events happen at his disposal, at his timing. Who's in charge? You want me to encourage you real real strongly? The Democrats are not in charge. Thank God, neither are the Republicans, nor the independents, nor the president, nor those who want to be president, nor the globalists who behind the scenes are trying to do all kinds of things. Jesus Christ sits on the throne of absolute supreme authority, and not only is there sowing and reaping that is in session in our world on an individual basis, individual basis, but Jesus is at work in the events of all the earth until he returns. And so at the end of chapter 6, 
there is a startling new vision of Jesus as we behold the Lamb. And it's very encouraging. Might not sound encouraging, but it's very encouraging. The Lamb in all of his wrath is revealed. God has all of the injustice of the world covered. He's going to take care of it. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, he sends his wrath. At the end of chapter 6, he says, the wrath of lamb, the wrath of the lamb has come, and who shall be able to stand? That's a rhetorical question, meaning... You have nothing by which you can stand and stand up to the wrath of God. The wrath of the Lamb. But before the first eight verses of chapter 7, before he begins to pour out his wrath, he protects his servants. 12,000 out of each of the tribes of Israel. Now we could go on a side journey and try to figure out exactly who they are and where they are today and, and, and all this and, and miss the main point. That's a part of the problem that people get into when they go to the revelation, they turn aside from beholding him. What's the point? The point is Jesus is at work. He is in charge. He moves through angelic beings to seal and to protect a large host, not only the 12 tribes, but a numberless multitude. What does he protect them for? What does he protect them from? Oh, I tell you what I'm excited about. He's going to take me from the great tribulation. That's not what he says. The great tribulation is peanuts. You know what he is sealing these servants to be protected from? The wrath of Almighty God. It's coming. It's already here, Romans chapter 1. Where when people are not willing for God to be God in their life, not willing to be thankful, not willing to submit to them, and he gives them over. We're living in a time of humans being given over. Okay, you don't want me? I'm, release, I'm releasing the restraints. And people are going down roads further than they've ever gone down in our lifetime. A sign of the, of the wrath of God upon our world. But before he unloads his wrath, beginning in chapter 7, he first of all seals and protects his saints. He said, who shall be able to stand? Only those whose sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus. You don't have to understand a lot of things here to this morning, but you need to understand this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wrath of God is coming and the only place of refuge is at the cross only the blood of the lamb will shield us from the wrath of the lamb am I shielded we see in chapter 7 great tribulation saints and others all through the revelation in huge numbers. All of them redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Some of them go through what is called the Great Tribulation. Some don't. But that's not the issue. They are all protected from the holy wrath of God. And in chapter 7, we see them on the other side of the river this numberless multitude, and they are worshiping and praising and rejoicing in God. And I've read that chapter, and I don't find a single one of them, of those who had gone through the great tribulation, and now they're worshiping God on the other side of the river, and I don't see a single one of them saying, well, well, praise the Lord for heaven, but you won't believe what we had to go through to get here. We had 
Oh, you had it easy. You didn't have to go through the great tribulation. I had to. Look at the latter verses of chapter five, chapter seven. Because of the Lamb, because of both, behold the Lamb. Because look at look at what's coming. In chapter five, chapter seven, verse fifteen. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sat on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun of the light of the sun hit them with heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away their tears from their eyes. All that's in store for the Christian because of the Lamb. An eternity of unwearied service. An eternity of unbounded security. An eternity of unblemished, unending satisfaction. This is the vision we need to gaze upon. Oh, you're here today and you're weary. Revelation lets us ask the countless multitudes who have gone before us a huge question. Was it worth it to follow Jesus? I was looking at people down here on earth and some of them who follow Jesus sincerely so and they have such a rough time. Look at Job, Old Testament saint. God doesn't take very good care of his property, does he? Look at all the stuff he allows them or brings them through. Bad looking, gazing at the wrong thing. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17, those in heaven, whether no matter what they went through on earth, they just say, look at us. Look at us now. Worshiping, serving. Romans 8, 18 is true. Whatever you've gone through is not worthy to be compared to the glory that you're going to have. There's enough bad stuff going on in this world and in your world that if you don't take the long view, you're going to faint. And so will I. We live in a world of, of counterfeits, a world of trouble and trials, a world where evil seems to triumph. But we're controlled to a great degree by our vision, the focus of our vision. What are we looking at? The Revelation says, behold the Lamb. Look at all the blessings you have now and look at all the blessings that are coming. Behold the Lamb. From without, persecution. Rome ruled supreme for those who first got this book. From within, their own flesh. False prophets. Is it worth it? The demonic whispers. You're a fool for being a Christian. Look what it gets you. The book of Revelation was to those first Christians and to believers of all time a book to correct our vision. You will be greatly affected by what you focus on. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb by looking at the testimonies of those who have gone before us. Hebrews chapter 11 that takes you back all the way through the Bible. Behold the Lamb by looking at the testimonies of those that presently we've never met. And some were who've gone before us, face all manner of tribulation, trial, trouble. Some will have faced what is called the great tribulation, but none of them have any regrets. They all shout, it's worth it. Okay, so I'm going to lose a friend. I'm going to lose a date. I'm going to lose a position. 
You have an old man dwelling with inside you that wants to be gratified, that wants to be liked, that wants to be loved, wants people to think good of them, wants to have glory and honor and, and prestige and uh, get all the gusto you can and sit on a lid and poison the rest. Be selfish. There's a world out there that wants to be pleased. If I forsake all and take up the cross and follow Jesus, is it worth it? I want to say that it is. I hope you say that it is. And I hope that you will devour all the story that's involved in Hebrews chapter 11. And then the conclusion that's in those first four verses of chapter 12. And I hope that you will turn to the revelation with eyes that you've never had focus, so focused like this before. I'm going to take God at his word. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. I want to see what he's doing, what he's done, what he's going to do. And I want to be encouraged because I'm one of his, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've shared many times. I could, there's some scenes that happen and you just can't forget them. I had taught something maybe similar to this in the Sunday school class that met in this auditorium. And a young Christian lady came down, the, oh, the podium, my podium was down there, and the lady came down with tears flowing down her cheek. She had just been confronted with the reality that very often in this life, Christians suffer even martyrdom. And the first words out of her mouth through her tears were, I thought Jesus loved us too much to let us go through anything like that. Well, I listened. I didn't condemn her. I understood where she was coming from. And I simply opened my Bible to the first chapter of the Revelation that, it, uh, that unveils Jesus. John to the seven churches. And it's from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and of the princes of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's how you know Jesus loves you. That's how you know if you have seen Jesus and if you are one who beholds him because that is the most precious thing in all the world to you, that Jesus Christ Prince of the kings of the earth loved you and washed you from your sins in, your own blood, in his own blood. And if you hear this morning and your sins have not been washed away in the blood of Christ, come to him. Flee to him. All who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. Come to Jesus. Behold him. No one will stand unless their sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus.